So what does a reptile respond to? What does it see? What does it feel? What does its brain and the cells in its body respond to? And what has it evolved to benefit from? And the answer has to be it responds to its entire microhabitat. The first all-in-one bulbs that provide UVB, UVB, uh, UVA, visible light and infrared were mercury vapour lamps. So if we have a look at that, this is the sunlight. This is just the, spe the part with the sunlight up to the end of the red spectrum that we can see. If we put the mercury vapour light on it, you can see that it looks terrible, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's just, it's just a few spikes. That's an absolutely typical mercury vapour lamp. They're all like that. So then, you know, theoretically, just say you have an animal that spends most of its time in a hide and it would see the mouth of the hide as the light and that's going to give its cue. You could see a keeper saying, well, why don't I just provide like a simple light bulb that's going to signify the day night? And why do I need to go to the lengths of going UV, full spectrum and infrared if it's only going to be using it as a visual cue? if that makes sense. Well, well it, it isn't really, is it? Welcome to episode number 104 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We have a very special guest on the podcast today. This is an episode that I've been wanting to do for a while now, at least a couple of years. And this guest is probably one of the most recommended or most asked about guests. I get so many messages saying, hey, are you ever going to have this individual on? The answer has always been yes. We've just sort of been working, uh, waiting to find a time where our schedules match up. And they finally did. We recorded this episode about four or six weeks ago, somewhere around there. And it was fantastic. So joining me on the podcast today is Dr. Francis Baines. I imagine most of you are familiar with who Dr. Baines is. But if you're not, you're about to be because this is an incredibly thorough episode. Dr. Baines is, I'm going to use this term, I know she won't want me to, but she is an expert when it comes to reptile lighting. And she is really one of the top experts in herpetoculture when it comes to reptile lighting. She is a vet out of the UK, but she's spent a huge portion of her career studying UV and reptile lighting in general and how important it is to provide optimal lighting for our reptiles. She also has been testing bulbs and providing feedback to companies as they develop new technology. And she really is one of the best resources when it comes to reptile lighting in herpetoculture, full stop. So as everyone knows, lighting is one of the most complicated topics and one of the most complicated aspects of keeping captive reptiles. And this episode, we do delve quite deep into lighting, but it also at the same time seems like we are just scratching the surface. We are going to do more with Dr. Baines in the future. I won't say anything more about that because we haven't quite solidified what we're going to do yet, but we're going to do more. So if at the end of this episode, you are still hungry for more information, don't worry. There's more to come. If you get to the end of this episode and you just feel like you've been hit by a bulldozer with information, go back and listen to it again. You may have to listen to it a couple of times. I'm probably going to clip out a few clips of this podcast and put on the clips channel, which I haven't used in a while, just because I think there's some really good concise sort of five seven minute clips that will be very useful for most keepers if you are listening to this on the audio version there is quite a few visual aspects to this podcast i still recommend listening to it if you're in your car or working out or, or whatnot listen to it go through it once but you'll probably want to go back to the youtube video at some point in the next couple of days and go at least to the sections which i will have time stamped go to the sections where there is sections of the powerpoint project which dr baines shows us which will help probably solidify some of those concepts a little bit easier if you're having trouble visualizing it while you're just listening to it. So in this episode, we discuss Dr. Bain's history, how she got sucked into the world of reptile lighting. We discuss this dichotomy that I'm starting to see develop, and that is the should we provide full spectrum or should we strive to provide full spectrum sunlight artificially or should we take a look at the solar spectrum and pick out the parts of the solar spectrum that we know to be beneficial the section that provides d3 synthesis the section that provides visual light and so on and so on can we actually pull out pieces of the spectrum or should we just automatically strive for the full spectrum we discuss reptile lighting for nocturnal species we discuss uvb and d3 synthesis and also why D3 is important beyond calcium metabolism, which is really fascinating. We get into a really, uh, quite a lot of detail there as well. We discuss the different parts of the spectrum, the UV, the visual light, and the infrared, and what each of those parts do. And we discuss dawn and dusk and whether or not that is important to simulate and a few other things as well. Again, this is quite a complex episode, so it's probably going to be something you're going to want to watch or listen to a few times. 
Before we jump into the episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com if you are looking for more information on the show. Anything that's mentioned in this podcast will be there in a link, so just click on Animals at Home Podcast and head to the show tile and you'll see it all there. If you are interested in joining us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash animals at home. And thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring the episode of the podcast. They are an affiliate sponsor, so if you do make a purchase by clicking on one of the links in the YouTube description or the show notes, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that helps me support the show. And I think that's it. Let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. Dr. Baines, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. You have been on my guest list for a long time, well over a year. And we've been talking about doing this for a while too. It just took a while for our schedules to match up. And I constantly have people messaging me, are you going to ever have Dr. Baines on? So today is the day we're doing it. So I'm very excited to have you on. And I think most people will be very familiar with who you are, but maybe we could just give you a quick background of, of, of who you are and and how you got into reptiles initially and then maybe some of yeah. your education as well. Well, I loved reptiles and amphibians ever since I found my first lizards and newts. I was living in um, in Bournemouth. I grew up in Bournemouth in, in Hampshire. It's a little seaside town. And... Um, there was quite a little a few colonies of things growing in the wild in, in remnants of moorland near my home. Um, I was a teenager in the mid-1960s, and I completely ignored the 60s hippie scene because I loved catching lizards on my bare hands, used to be covered in gorse thorns. I was a weird teenager. <laughs> um, and uh, back in those days, I used to keep them for a couple of days. Never occurred to me um, that it would be possible to keep them as pets. I didn't really know much about keeping exotic animals. I didn't even know that it would be possible to keep them. And uh, but, we, but I always did love animals. And we had a succession of traditional pets, um, hamsters, guinea pigs, budgies. We had a pair of dachshunds. And um, I somehow got into Cambridge University and began my five-year training as a vet. And I qualified from Cambridge Veterinary School in 1980. I married my long-suffering fiancé, Peter, the following week. <laughs> We'd been engaged for four years because we decided to wait until I'd finished my training. Um, and I worked as a vet in a small animal practice in a small country town called Leighton Buzzard in Bedfordshire, where we lived then. Um, in those days, to be honest, most vets knew very little about reptiles. Uh, the whole time I worked there, I think the only reptiles I saw were what we called garden tortoises, and we had hardly anything to offer them. The husbandry guidelines, looking back, I mean, they were appalling, really. Well, I retired from general practice shortly after my daughter was born. And after my son arrived three years later, I didn't go back to veterinary work at all. We moved house several times with my husband's career. Um, and I did some really interesting things when I was at home with the children. Um, they included, oh, researching the hand rearing of orphan puppies and kittens. I reared a few. Then I became a counsellor for the National Childbirth Trust when we lived in Oxford. And then we lived in a village in Hampshire and I became a classroom assistant for children with special needs. Um, oh, and while I was there, I helped create a huge community wildlife garden. And I run a youth group um, when I was there. And then in 1994, we moved here to a village, this is a village called Govilan in Wales. And I set up my own business as a wildlife artist and a mural painter. So totally different. Um, yeah, we've been I had here no idea about that. Yeah, yeah, we have. We've been here 27 years. We're on the edge of the Brecon Beacons. It's a range of Welsh mountains and hills. And there are viviparous lizards, that's Sutoka vivipara. There are adders, viperberus, grass snakes, natrix, natrix, and slow worms, my favourites, angris fragilis. They're up on the hillsides above our home, but we're lucky because we actually get the slow worms in our garden. Mm. And I suppose it was after we came to Wales, really, that lizards came back into my life. Because when my daughter was 12, I thought she'd be old enough to care for a pet of her own. And she joined the junior branch of the British Herpetological Society, or BHS. And at first, we used to join club meets because they used to have them for the young people to see herps in the wild. 
And then she chose a baby leopard gecko, which was bred by another junior member. This was 1995. We were keen members of the BHS. And she used to take her little gecko called Custard to various educational events and talk husbandry to people that came along. And in 1999, my son was 12 and he chose a baby bearded dragon, Pog. Well, Pog was the most beautiful beardy with a huge personality. And uh, of course, one of each soon became two of each. And then we had little menageries and little reptile dynasties. But at that time, no one gave UVB to leopard geckos. Um, but we did diligently buy UVB tubes for the beardies every six months. Uh, we joined a local group of reptile keepers. They met once a month, about an hour's drive away. And this was called the South Wales branch of ASRA, the Association for the Study of Reptiles and Amphibians. That became South Wales Reptile and Exotic Animal Group when ASRA closed. And I was secretary of that group for many years. But in 2001, we got our first computer and the internet. I mean, that was just fatal. A few weeks later, I came across a brand new forum being set up by three hobbyists who I had no idea who they were. Their names were Gordon, Steve and Mark. You know who you are, guys, if you're watching. They named it ARK Group and ARK stood for Advanced Reptile Keepers because we thought we knew quite a lot in those days. And I was literally their first forum member and that was my new career. We met in real life at the first ever reptile show I went to in Dorset in 2002. And that was where I invested in this really expensive new lamp. It was one of the first mercury vapor lamps you could buy. And the claims for its output and its longevity, I mean, you wouldn't believe it, it was a phenomenal. But about a year later, our beloved male beardy pog fell only about two feet off his basking branch. And he damaged his hip and it turned out he had MVD and I was absolutely appalled. And I tried to find out why. And to my amazement, I discovered that no one, not even the manufacturers, actually could tell me what UVB output their lamps were emitting. Wow. So that was a bit of a shock. And of course, being me, I just thought, I'm not having this. I'm going to sort this out. <laughs> so I discovered another new forum. It was called the UVB Meter Owners. It was an American forum, and I learned of something called a solar meter, one of these. Was that a reptile form, or was that just yeah, something? Yeah, it oh, was, was okay. UVB meters for reptiles, yeah. Okay. And it was just starting up. People had just heard of these and decided to buy them. Um, they were manufactured originally for tanning lamps, this kind of thing. And through that form, I met an electronics engineer. He was also a chameleon specialist. His name was Andy Beveridge. And two other friends, Rob Lane and Rachel Hitch. And we imported, with a great deal of difficulty, the first solar meters into the UK. And when I got mine, I soon discovered that this amazing mercury vapor lamp was indeed amazing, but it was amazingly bad. <laughs> and I vowed that I'd test every UVB lamp on sale in the UK. Well, at that time, there were only three manufacturers, so it didn't seem too big a task. But then this guy named Bob McCarger from America on the for through the forum sent me samples of a new invention, the Mega Ray. Mm -hmm. And all the way from North Carolina, he sent them and he sent a ballast as well so I could use the English voltage with the American lamp. And everything got really busy after that. So I guess that's really how, how I got into looking at reptiles yeah it, it, it's a great story and i think i'm sure it must have been because like you said you know people were using uv back in the late 90s and mid 90s and whatnot but i'm sure having that experience of measuring that first bulb must have just opened up this giant spider web of confusion and where do we go from here and so so what did you do next once you started testing bulbs were you like oh right where do you go yeah from well, there? this is yeah this is really how the uv guide started mm -hmm. Well, I had, uh, my three new friends and I created this website called UV Guide in 2005. And I can just show you that, actually. Um, yeah, this is our little website to publish our findings. Well, unfortunately, that, that little website hasn't been updated for years. I've just never had time to do it. But that was the beginning. 
And Andy Beveridge then gave me his spectrometer on semi-permanent loan. Well, I'd never seen a spectrometer. I didn't know anything about it, but he taught me how to use it. Well, the other two in the group kind of moved on to other things, but Andy and I kept on testing. And we even took the meters and the spectrometer on field trips. And this is us in Mindo Cloud Forest in Ecuador. Wow. And we're taking a spectrum of the light in the, in the, um, in the canopy, under the canopy. And um, it, it was a wonderful holiday that was. We went to Galapagos. That's and amazing. This is me in Nulanji in Kakadu in Australia. And after that, for every holiday I went, I was an absolute nightmare because I was forever going, stop the car, we must take a UV reading <laughs> every hour. So I'd look at my watch and I'd say, need time to stop for another reading. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, you get, you get really excited about these things. Well, I do. Um, well, and you got to get so, that data. And, that, and that's the thing is back yeah, then yeah. The, mm. it was understood that UV needed to be there, but there was just no data behind it, right? It was just buy yeah, your bulb right. and then that was it. Yeah. And of course, in 2006, we got these, we got the UV index meters, which made a huge difference. Right. Um, but, you know, back to the story, if I just um, stop that. Um, well, um, Andy introduced me to the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria, Biaza for short and the zoo world and zookeeper douglas sheriff who was then at chester zoo had been working a lot with uv and he invited me to present our work at my first zookeepers conference which was at blackpool zoo in 2005 um, and maybe it wouldn't have gone much further but between 2006 and 2007 a lot of the reptile supply companies were jumping on the bandwagon and trying to provide ever stronger UVB lamps. And there came up a problem with lamps from several of the major manufacturers um, supplying. They were causing UVB burns to eyes and skin and a horrifying 10% death rate in, in the younger animals. Wow. And no one could work out why, because the total UVB readings with the UV meters were quite low. But there were some amazing people on the forums across the world. And I started collecting case histories from them. And they even sent me samples of the lamps. And there was one American forum, readiersliders.com. I think that's right. And they, they, they produced a dossier of all the lamps that they had problems with. And they then sent a whole box full of these lamps right across the pond for me to test. Well, with the help of the spectrometer and the UV index meter, what I discovered was that they were all emitting unnaturally short wavelengths UVB, which isn't found in sunlight, but not UVC. But only tiny amounts of this short wavelength UVB could, could burn the eyes. Well, the companies did believe all the reports we sent and the affected lamps were withdrawn and they realized what the problem was. And after that, um, they started getting me to screen their prototype replacements which was quite amazing really and then other companies started sending me samples to test for them too and it was like the business took off um, but in june 2007 the curator at zsl london zoo richard gibson invited me to join the biaza reptile and amphibian working group we called it rorg and he insisted I become an appointed advisor on lighting for the UK zoos. Well, the following year, they set up a UV focus group and I was asked to be coordinator of the group. And at first I was really daunted because I was really new to the zoo world. But they wanted us to create a guide to the use of UV with reptiles and amphibians in zoos. And it was to be called a UV tool. This UV tool, I discovered I had this remarkable team. It was spread across six zoos and they were really supportive and they were keen to work on the product. And, and we worked on it for several years. We based it on some pioneering work by Professor Gary Ferguson and his team at Texas Christian University. And they were way ahead of us. They were measuring the UV in natural exposure of reptiles. They were following them around in the wild in America and in Jamaica and places like that. And we had many long email conversations with Gary and his colleague, Dr. William German. And it was wonderful to learn from them. They drafted a set of guidelines for UV exposure based on their research. They, had, they published it in 2010. 
and they encouraged us to adapt it for use in the UK zoos. So we did. And I said, well, I think it should be called the Ferguson Zones, their, their UV zones, in honour of their inventor. And the name caught on straight away. And we launched the first version of the Piazza UV tool in November 2012. So you actually named the Ferguson Zones. You came up with that name. Well, yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Well, Gary wasn't very keen on it to start with. But I <laughs> well, said, but you can't just call it the zones. And yeah, he yeah. sort of gave in. <laughs> but he was he was lovely, actually, about it, really. And um, we, we had contributions from 15 zoos. And then we had about, I don't know, about 11 independent contributors. And some of them, I expect, if you look at the names, I expect some of the names are, are familiar. It was yep. a wonderful, wonderful project. Um, and uh, it's been updated several times. It's now got estimates, they are estimates, for the suitable ranges of UV for about 266 species. Wow. And it was published in the peer-reviewed journal, uh, Journal of Zoo and Aquarium Research, or JZAR, in 2016. And I expect you'll probably have seen um, simplified versions of it popping yeah. up. Um, that's appeared in several magazines and versions of it in websites, and as you turned up in the chapters and a couple of veterinary textbooks. Well, the raw group have carried on working quite actively ever since, and we've delivered um, and developed things like UV lighting systems for huge enclosures. You can see here you've got a huge area of UV about five, four or five metres across for the tortoises with these high output T5 tubes, you've got metal halides for the visible light and you've got infrared heaters, the patio lamps for, for the infrared. Mm. And these have worked really well. Quite a lot of the zoos are, are using these now, which is quite exciting. And we developed things like uh, methods for conducting lighting audits and care guides and uh, looked at those heaters. And this is our ROG members annual meeting. That was the last one before the COVID lockdown. That was May 2019 at Marwell Zoo. Mm. And we ran a lighting workshop there. Well, that September, I was able to meet Gary Ferguson in person. Um, we went to the um, AHH meeting in um, Rodeo in New Mexico, where he was our keynote speaker. And uh, it was a special occasion for me, as you can imagine. Here's, here's Gary with me and my friend and colleague Ron Murin and his wife Judy Dylan's interviewed you interviewed uh, a Rom haven't you so, yes uh, yeah Rom's been on the show yeah, yeah. So, so that's all how how it came about really um that's amazing it's amazing so, uh, to think how much we almost take for granted now as far as UV goes it's like we all know where to go for the Ferguson zones look what we're trying to get and you know use your meter to get the basking zone correct and it's sort of amazing how it, absent the information was in the 2000s and and yeah. how everybody was just sort of testing you know you buy a bulb and hopefully it works the bulbs that were producing the shortwave uvb were those coil bulbs or were those actually like t8 tubes as well it was all of them it was it was oh, okay. the whole range because they were using a different phosphor um and they were using different glass and it was letting through the shorter wavelengths right gotcha. down to uvc but wow the companies now have really worked hard on it and and it's quite rare there are still a few random small chinese companies still producing ones that come out with bad spectra but they're quite rare now and it's usually prototypes from a small company that wants to get involved with, with uv producing big companies are pretty well aware of what they're looking for and some of them have even developed um, they've even bought spectrometers which is really mm -hmm. exciting encouraging yeah, it's really amazing how far that's come, even in the last decade then. It's just sort of ramped up really quickly. Well, why don't we jump into some of the more specifics with this? Because, you know, one of the areas that I've been seeing now is it sort of seems like there's two schools of thought beginning to form, especially as technology develops and we have more access to LED bulbs, which can be a lot tighter on the on the spectrum production. I, I see one school of thought that says we should we should try to strive to provide the full solar spectrum as much mm -hmm. as we can, as much as the bulbs make it possible. And then there's another school of thought that seems like we can use tighter bandwidths to provide the bands that we think are beneficial. So you know, mm -hmm. a tight band for UVB product or for D3 synthesis and and whatever you know basically picking and choosing wavelengths of energy for the animal. We don't have to have the full spectrum. We can just have this sort of 
you know, patches of it. Yeah. So I was curious what your thoughts on there, if, if you've noticed that as well, and where do you sit on that uh, yes, school of yes, thought? Yes, definitely. I think it's a really good question because people often tackle me on very specific issues. They're nearly always related to just one tiny part of the sun spectrum, like the exact wavelengths involved in vitamin D synthesis or the exact wavelengths that cue the brain about day lengths. And that's, I think, because as human beings, really, we're very good at putting things into categories and getting very specific. So we get, you know, this is what causes that, or we need this to get that. And we divide everything up. So we say this is blue and that is green. He is Welsh, I'm English. These reptiles are diurnal and these are nocturnal. We don't like the distinctions to blur. And sometimes we don't even have words for it. Um, I mean, for example, we say blue-green. We don't really have a, a word for the intermediate. We say somebody's half Welsh and half English. Oh, we do have cathemeral, so that's, that's something. But... Um, I think what it's meant is that we've separated heat from light from UV, and we've even split these into subdivisions. I mean, don't get me started, there's UVB, UVA, infrared A, B, C, there's blue light, green light, red, and we've discovered they all do different things, which, I mean, perhaps we can talk about that a bit later on, but, but I mean, if we look at this guy, um, um, this is a little nile monitor that's we met in Kruger National Park in South Africa. So what does a reptile respond to? What does it see? What does it feel? What does its brain and the cells in its body respond to? And what has it evolved to benefit from? And the answer has to be it responds to its entire microhabitat. Everything around it, everything plays at least some role in its life. It's basically, it's holistic. And I think that's something that humans are terrible at. Mm -hmm. So it's responding to the whole of the sun spectrum from UVB to infrared B in its natural proportions and amounts in the place where it evolved. So the lizard, the turtle, the snake, it's not splitting up light from heat or UV from light because sunlight's providing all those things together in proportion with each other. So its instincts are responding to signals from one part of the spectrum. It may be obtaining benefits from all the rest. So if we look at that young Nile monitor, he's waking up, he sees a sunlit patch of rock, and he goes there just because he knows it will feel good. Mm -hmm. So there he's absorbing energy from the invisible infrared and from the light, and it's warming him up. So we say he's thermoregulating. But what he's actually doing is absorbing all the wavelengths in the sunlight, and they all have different functions as well as supplying warmth. I mean, the obvious example is that UVB is enabling vitamin D synthesis in his skin. Well, his skin has evolved to the right thickness and the right color to absorb the right amount of UVB in the time he would normally spend in either direct sun or daylight each day. And vitamin D synthesis being a two-stage process, it also requires warmth. So at the same time that the UV is converting the cholesterol in his skin to pre-D3, the warmth is converting the pre-D3 to vitamin D3. So you say, well, how long is he going to bask for? Well, he controls the time he spends in the sunlight by a temperature-sensitive cells in his brain, in the, in the hypothalamus, but also temperature sending nerve, nerve endings in his skin and also in various organs of his body, like just around the heart. And these are responding to heat generated from short wavelength infrared in sunlight that reaches him directly, as well as to warmth conducted from the skin surface and he's sitting on the rock. And it's all part of that same continuous spectrum. Everything's interlinked. Mm -hmm. And every year we keep finding new things that reveal yet more complexity. It gets more and more complicated and my, my lectures get longer and longer. <laughs> and the importance of not just individual parts of the spectrum, but also their intensity and their relationship to each other. And if we've got a minute, I'll just, I'll just show you some spectra. Yeah. This is the spectrum of sunlight. Um, the Earth's atmosphere filters out all the very short wavelength stuff that's in this direction. And it just lets through some a little bit of UVB from about 295 nanometers, this is wavelengths upwards. Just a little bit of UVB, a lot more UVA, absolute flood, shed loads of visible light, 
a lot of infrared A and a little bit of infrared B. So life on Earth evolved under all of this, and it's evolved to use every bit of it that it can in all the different biochemical ways. It's, it's a continuum. It's like a flood of, of energy. And I think messing up this relationship and splitting up heat, light and UV artificially by using lamps that are spread out or only producing short wavelengths can lead to some really weird abnormal effects. And there's some quite good experiments actually that have been done over the years. Um, for example, there was a trial done with wool lizards, Podarchis muralis. What they did was they warmed the floor of a cage to a set temperature, and then they shone a narrow beam of light onto one area, one little sort of circle. They filtered it to remove the infrared wavelengths, so it wasn't strong enough to cause any detectable change in the surface temperature in that little circle. And they found that the lizards positioned themselves really accurately with their backs under the centre of the beam, although it was no warmer there than anywhere else. Mm. Now, Rob Murin has just done some trials with collared lizards, and he's found something very similar. And if you go to his um, link on the reptile lighting form, you can watch this little video. And what he did was he tried um, three different um, basking areas and he had the same UV for all of them. And he had all the basking surface temperatures, which was there, there and there, exactly the same at 32 degrees. And in one, he had a DHP, a deep heat projector. In one, he had a halogen and in one, he had an LED. And he time-lapsed them and measured how much time they spent. And you can just about see on here, you've got the collared lizards tending to go to the, the LED or the halogen, mm -hmm. and mostly the LED. And so what it looks like is that the, the sun, the sun-basking animals are going for the light. They're going for what they perceive as a patch of sunlight, although the warmth is the same on all of them. Well, there was another study done earlier, um, a peer-reviewed study, which, um, which I can show you. Um, it was using two species of animals. One species was sunbaskers, the crystallatus, and the second were thermoconformers, the gundlachi. And they kept the whole cage at the, either at the preferred body temperature or slightly too warm or slightly too cold. But the cage was half illuminated, so half of it was shaded and half was not, but the temperature inside was the same. And the sun basking species, they associated brightness with warmth. So if the whole cage was cold, they went and sat in the lighted area. If the whole cage was too hot, they all sat in the shaded area, although the temperatures were completely the same all the way across. But the thermoconformers, didn't seem to care. They just sat anywhere mm. because they didn't show that preference. So they weren't using sunlight as an indicator of heat, presumably because in the areas where they live, the sunlight isn't producing hot sunbeams and then they don't bask. So it's, so it's quite interesting to find that different species are going to vary, but they're all using their environment to decide what they do. But it's actually more complicated even than that because when we set up our lamps, we always say, you know, we should have the bright light over the basking zone and that will make a little patch of sunlight. But people say, well, why do you have to do that? You know, they put the light down one end and the UV up the other end. Well, there was a really good study done with Tokei geckos, which are the nocturnal ones, of course. And what they did, they set up the first test very much like the previous ones. They had a heater down one end with the bright light and a shield so that it wasn't the light that was causing the warmth. And they put the toke geckos in there. And they found that over 24 hours with the light going on and going off again, the geckos had a kind of a circadian rhythm in preferred body temperature. So they would change their body temperature day and night. And the most precise thermoregulation they were doing during the night when they were active, which is kind of what you'd expect. But when the bright light was positioned over the wrong end, over the cold end, which is a very odd place for the, for the light to be, what happened then was that the geckos lowered their body temperature altogether and they lost the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. They also thermoregulated less precisely at night. 
So it was almost as if they were sensing there was no warmth in the sun anymore. And that was changing the way they were regulated. Well, in a third scenario, they put a uniform gentle light over the whole area to see what they would do. And they discovered it was very much like the first one where the, the light was at one end. They still had their daily rhythms on and off um, and didn't face them at all. But the curious thing was that this group of, 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 uh, of researchers, Sievert and Hutchison, they then did it with collared lizards. And these are a diurnal species, completely different. And they found that they lost their natural rhythmic swings when the uniform lighting they were given. There wasn't any basking lamp. There was, there was no sun patch. Wow. So what does that tell us about alvivarium lighting and how important it is to get it right to recreate the natural situation for the animal as best we can. And they yeah. also, there are also studies have done when day length has changed, that also alters the preferred body temperatures and the basking preferences because day length changes with seasons and so do the reptile behaviours. It's like they're hardwired to the patterns of sunlight that they would have experienced as they evolved over days and over the years. That is incredible. Um, it's it's yeah, amazing it how yeah. how much you could mess it up by, really, like yeah. how how, yeah. how wrong you can get it. Well, yeah, and and we're learning. You know, we always talk about putting the lights in a certain place and 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 that, but but it really is. It really makes a difference. And I think we've only talked about separating light and infrared. Um, experiments have been done with different different parts of the visible light, different coloured light on basking. Um, there was another experiment done with the wall lizards and they kept the temperature constant, but the visible light started off with being white light. And then they changed it by putting filters across to remove parts of the spectrum. And first of all, they removed any blue light below 480 nanometers. So there's still a tiny bit of sort of turquoise blue, but most of the blue had gone. And of course the UVA wasn't there in the first place. And then they removed the blue and the green. So it leaves a little bit of green, but mostly the oranges and, and reds. And what they discovered that when they just removed the blue wavelengths, this one, it, it left a sort of greenish yellow light to our eyes. We don't quite know what color it was to the lizards, but they didn't change their thermoregulating behavior much at all. They, they didn't change the rate of warming. They didn't change the amount of time they spent basking. But when they removed the blue and most of the green, leaving the yellow, orange and red, the lizards reduced their preferred body temperature, they reduced their rate of heat gain, and they basked for longer. So the colour of the light, the lack of these wavelengths, changed the way they behaved. Wow. And when you think the way we, le we light our animals, you know, it, it really, it, it, we don't know this, we, we, we just don't. Well, the authors of the study, what they did was they speculated that blue light is the strongest inhibitor of melatonin. Mm. So the effect could be due to the removal of the blue wavelengths, allowing the brain to synthesize melatonin. And that hormone has powerful effects on daily rhythms, and it does include thermoregulation in, in reptiles. Well, I think the relevance to this in real life is that when the sun is low in the sky, as it is at sunrise, sunset, and all day in the winter in higher latitudes, there's less blue in the sunlight. And at night, of course, there's none. So blue is a very important wavelength for modifying circadian and seasonal rhythms because it acts as a really powerful signal to the brain saying it's daytime. So I think these are just a couple of examples. I mean, sunlight and its effects can't really be separated up into heat, light and UV. We haven't even mentioned UV yet. Mm -hmm. um, what's more, the, the sun spectrum has very specific amounts of each wavelength, all of which are used for something by the body and all of which vary with time of day, time of year. And we only know some of those uses. We keep finding more. And the questions are still just as relevant as they've always been. How much of each wavelength does each species need? Does the amount vary with season? Does it vary with time of day? We haven't any clear answers. We haven't even any clear answers for, for the way that um, UV, we, we just have crude estimates for the UV. And certainly only crude, crude estimates for the temperature, which is not even the same as the infrared. 
and we have almost nothing for visible light at all because no one's gone out there and measured it in the wild. Right. Um, so we can't really pull apart the spectrum and provide these important spikes of energy because the only thing we can deduce from the evidence we're collecting is that it's all important. Right. Every so time think, we look into something, we yeah, find another piece of important yeah. and material. And I think we really, we do need to reproduce it as faithfully as we can. Um, but it is actually really difficult because not only is this sunlight a continuum from UVB right through to infrared, it's also changing from dawn to dusk, from winter to summer, from full sun to full shade. And it's changing in spectrum as well as intensity. So it's a big puzzle. It really is. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And as you look into it further, yeah. you realize how complicated. And it sort of reminds me of almost like the difference between Eastern and Western medicine. I, you know, Eastern medicine is a lot yes. more holistic. Yes. They, they will provide yes. like a, yes. an herb or a plant and you take the whole thing where Western medicine goes, okay, what? alkaloid in that plant is usable and we turn that into a pill where the eastern yes. medicine says no you have to have yeah, the whole plant true. the whole plant is important and i think that's a, a decent analogy for what we're kind of doing here yeah as long as as long as we don't end up thinking we can use body parts of animals for, for it yes yes yeah exactly yeah there's yeah. <laughs> there's, there's certain parts of eastern medicine that we want to stay away from but uh yes. so yeah, as far I know, as i know you, yeah you, what you mean is the holistic side of it we, we yeah mean, well, we're beginning to understand it. Um, there's, there's, there's aspects in medicine which are getting better, but, but that's beside the point as to for what we're talking about. So as far as yeah. replicating the sunlight goes, how, how, how do we do this? What, what, as far as right now, because even listening to you talking about you know the different levels of visible light, someone could go to the dollar store and buy a cheap LED bulb and who knows what that light is giving off of and then who knows what result that it's doing to your animal. So what is the best, best method for attempting to do this where the technology is right now? Well, I think it was originally everyone wanted to get an all-in-one bulb. It was like the holy grail, wasn't it, that you'd have mm -hmm. an all-in-one that would do UV, heat, and light. But our current attempts haven't been very successful, and I think it'll be a long time before we can offer a really good sunlight simulator. I think our current mix-and-match solutions are probably even better than a single lamp would be, too, because then we can blend different spectra and we can vary the intensities of each, so they give us more flexibility and they give us more control. And I, I think I can show you what I mean by showing you the, the different spectra, mm -hmm. because people don't really, don't really often see this. So, and I think it's, it's really interesting. So here's our solar spectrum, and this is really the holy grail. So to start with, let's look at the part with the UVB and the visible light. So it's this part here. The first all-in-one bulbs that provide UVB, UVB, uh, UVA, visible light and infrared were mercury vapour lamps. So if we have a look at that, this is the sunlight. This is just the, spe the part with the sunlight up to the end of the red spectrum that we can see. If we put the mercury vapour light on it, you can see that it looks terrible, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's just, it's just a few spikes. That's an absolutely typical mercury vapour lamp. They're all like that, exactly, virtually exactly the same, because that's how, how mercury vapour works. And you've got um, the light looks a bit green to us, and it renders colours really badly, because our eyes have to kind of work out in our brains what those spikes are going to look out look like in the in the wild we have no idea what that looks like to a reptile right and it's spiky even in the uv range and it can't be dimmed it can't be thermostatically controlled and the other problem with mercury vapor is that they have very narrow beams so many brands do anyway so it only covers like a small circle and it's the other problem which is actually the biggest problem probably is that many brands are impossible to make with a consistent output. So you can get two identical bulbs in identical boxes. You take them out and you test them, and they're giving totally different amounts of UVB. Mm. Well, so they they saved thousands of animals, and you know they've been wonderful lamps. But there are now much better things, I think. Well, the successes in human lighting situations were metal halides, and you can see straight away there's a good metal halide for humans like this Philips one you've got a much more realistic looking solar spectrum really it sort of mirrors it almost you've got masses of UVA 
you've got quite a lot of, of all the colours in a continuous spectrum. It's spiky because there are lots of different chemicals involved, but it adds up to quite a good, a good spectrum. And in Europe, they're very widely used over vivariums. Um, they have an extremely bright, clean white light. And I think they're probably the best solar simulator in the visible range. And you can get versions now with UVB for reptiles. And in the USA, ZoomEd, ExoTerra have versions. And in Europe, there are a lot of brands. And in fact, there's even Omega Ray in Europe, which, which is a metal halide. And you can see now it's producing UV, uh, UVB as well. Mm. Um, but they've never been possible, really, to, to get them popular in the UK or the USA. And I think it's probably because they need external ballasts. Um, also, they're like mercury vapours. They can't be dimmed. They can't be put on a thermostat. And they have the same problem. They vary a lot in their UVB output. They tend to have narrow beams. And the ones designed for reptiles tend to lose their UVB fairly rapidly, but they do keep their visible light for years. And I've used mine for their visible light long after the UVB has gone. And I use other lamps for UVB next to them. I'm sort of surprised at how limited the infrared is from those bulbs. Yeah, well, metal halides are, are designed to produce much, much more in the visible light than in, okay. than in the infrared. Um, and in fact, the, the visible light is, is what heats, is what heats the animal. Oh, okay. It's much more than the infrared. Gotcha. They still have quite spiky UV um, because the, the halides they use for the UVB ones are not quite as well defined as, as the ones they use for human lighting. Um, but I think if you're looking at the UVB range, they're still spiky in the UVB. And I think the lamps which create the best in the UVB range are the fluorescent tubes. And you can see if you look at this UVB part, it, it matches the solar spectrum pretty well up to the boundary of UVB. That really is very nice. Um, but of course, the visible light is discontinuous um, and it's not very bright either, as we know from UV tubes not being particularly bright. They use a phosphor and a borosilicate glass to create that smooth increase in UVB with increasing wavelengths. So if we used an incandescent lamp, which is like a halogen flood or an incandescent flood, which will work like that, which looks like that, you've got a little bit of UVA and then gradually increasing with the increasing temperature, you get the increasing in red light. So you can blend those two and you can supplement the missing red and infrared really well. And you can add some of the other colours too. So you can make a blend and you can make quite a natural looking light. Now, you saw blue earlier on, and, and this is his lighting array under his basking zone. And I use that blend quite a lot. It's um, there's a T5 high output um, at the top. Then there's a metal halide and there's an incandescent flood lamp. Um, and blue looking a bit curious. <laughs> <laughs> and recently I was messing about with spectrometer down at Ron Murin's and I took the spectrum from the combo in his setup. Um, and you can have a look at that. It's there. And you can see it's also a T5 high output. It's also um, a halide and a um, incandescent lamp. And so it's filled out the spectrum. You've still got the UVB down here, you've still got a massive flood of visible light and you've got a build-up of the infrared, which, as you pointed out, on the, on the lamp on its own, is it fades off down here. But here you've got quite a decent amount of infrared. So that really is quite nice. Um, and, of course, it's got lots of UVA, which is, which is also very nice. Now, people always say, well, what about using LEDs instead? So that's, that's a spectrum of an absolutely typical white LED. They use a blue LED, a blue single colored LED to drive a phosphor, which emits the rest of the light. And as you can see, there's some big gaps. There is no UVA whatsoever, no UVB. There's a, a kind of a dip here with very little of the turquoise. And of course it runs off into the, into the red. So you could work that, you could put that into with, with ROM's combination with the T5 for the UVB and the halogen. And what you get is that, which you've now got a very nice UVB. You've got 
very nice visible light, lots of infrared, but you've got still got this big hole here. And I think that's the obvious gap. But again, you know, it's 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 getting there, isn't it? So people suggest using combinations of lamps. The only trouble is you end up with this huge clutter of domes yes. and tubes and cables all balanced together. And I can quite understand people going, oh, I can't cope with all these lamps. Um, and there isn't really an easy solution, but my Biasa group worked hard on this. And two years ago, two members of ROG, Jack Boltwood and Adam Trimmings at Ber Berkshire College of Agriculture, now they constructed a really neat all-in-one fixture. And there, it looked like that. And it held so two, two incandescent oh, yeah, lamps. Go ahead, yeah. Two incandescent lamps and two T5 high output tubes inside a metal frame. And it's a sort of plug and play basking zone. And this design was taken up by the UK company Arcadia. And I've got special permission to tell you this. The units are now being made commercially. And I had a flyer announcing their launch just last week. And they're going to call them Thermal Zoo Pro. They're about two foot long. So you could put them at one end of a large enclosure or a large tank. And you can chop and change what lamps you could put in them. You could put an LED in one or you could put a heat projector in one. So we're getting there. Um, the technology is getting there and the understanding of, of the basking zone is getting there. I'm sure other companies will come up with something similar too. And um, we're sort of improving all the time. And I think that's sort of where I'm at for that point of yeah. view of, of getting different spectra, getting going. Well, I think that design that you just showed at the end there is nice because one of the challenges I have, depending on the basking height, is is getting that blend, right? When you have a dome sitting next yeah. to a T5, and if, if you don't have enough height to have them blend down onto oh. a basking patch, it's just oh. it's, it's sort of like sectional. So that, that's another challenge as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So what about, we, we've sort of mentioned a little bit of infrared. So we've talked about the, the UV and visible light, and I think we'll get into a little more detail about those, uh, especially in the visible light in a second. But as far as rounding that spectrum out, the terrestrial solar spectrum, uh, on, on that one graph you had halogen. Is that kind of what, what you mainly recommend as far as getting into that infrared A? Yeah, the, the infrared. I think the halogen lamp covers it pretty well. Um, I can do a little bit more sharing screen stuff. We were looking at this part of the sunlight, but earlier we saw that the sunlight has a second half. Well, it's actually 48% that's infrared, and that's all of this. And you can see that the sunlight is mostly infrared A. Well, the halogen lamp covers that pretty well. Mm -hmm. That's the spectrum of a halogen lamp. So um, as long as you've got something good for the visible light, you're getting a lot of your infrared A from one of those. It, it, it fits it quite nicely. It's a little bit longer wavelength, but basically it's it's covering what we want. So that's quite good. And another one, a patio heater, is almost as good for very large enclosures, you know, like 1.5 kilowatts. They're really good. Of course, you lose the visible light from the halogen because they mainly just glow in, in orange and red, but you've still got the infrared A. This is why we talk about these, these patio heaters for the zoo enclosures. They're right. very, very good. So those are basically your basking lamps. Now, there's the heat projector, which is getting you know, obviously a lot of interest. And it's a carbon filament lamp. And what that means is that it's very, very good for warming the environment because it's got a lot of infrared B and a lot of short wave, a longer wavelength light, but it hasn't got very much infrared A. So it's very good for warming things, but it's not really suitable as a basking lamp. And if we look at the, um, the ceramic heat emitters, they're far worse altogether because as you can see, they've got no IRA, virtually no IRB, and, and they don't even start producing IRC until 2000, 3000 nanometers. So they're really only environmental heaters. They're, they're heating, um, they're heating the air, they're heating the surroundings. They're certainly not basking lamps. So that's my sort of take on basking lamps. Um, and I think that's pretty, pretty much all I want to say about those. Yeah. So a deep heat projector would be perfect yeah. if you need to maintain a nighttime temperature type thing. Oh, yeah. that, that's oh, not yeah. going to disrupt yeah. the, the day night cycle. 
Yeah, the reason they're good is that they heat directly and they heat the ground below. They don't just heat the air and, and the surroundings. So you're warming the substrate, which is basically like you know the hot pavement at night, which we all go looking for snakes on. That, that kind of warmth. Um, so that's that's producing that kind of heat. It's not basking heat at all. It's it's environmental. Yeah, and they're very good sense. for that. Very very good for that. So then, as far as the spectrum goes, there, there, as you kind of alluded to, every piece of the spectrum does something different. Some of some of the spectrum we probably have no idea yet. We're still looking at those things. So, can, can you briefly kind of run through what we're looking at as far as what each section of the spectrum do, and then maybe we'll yeah. get a little bit more yeah. into detail. Yeah, sure. If we start off with our long long wavelengths, we've just gone through. We've got our infrared and our red light, and they actually penetrate. The body of an animal quite quite well, particularly the um, short wavelength infrared that will penetrate right through. Um, I think we've pretty much covered that. Um, but also, um, red and infrared A have biological effects. It's not just warmth, and I think that's something we tend to completely forget. We tend to forget that it isn't just heating when things are thermoregulating, because red and infrared actually work on cells and they work on an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase, which is in skin cells. And it actually upregulates over a hundred genes. And they're very important for things like controlling cell growth and wound healing. Um, they change the way the immune system works. They promote the immune system for protecting against things like uh, UVA damage, in fact. So um, it's a sort of a a healing light. People talk about infrared as being a healing light, and it, it really is. And it's used a lot in in um, medical technology using low low level lasers and, and things like that. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons why wild animals heal up so well in the wild, and, and you know they're using this this natural light for for heating. And we move down the spectrum a bit to our visible light, visible perception. And um, we have to think about the way the reptile eyes work. Our eyes have got three cones. Uh, we've got three cones that re respond to different colours in the back of our retina. And um, there's a blue cone. Well, they say blue is responding most to blue light. One that responds most to green light and one that responds to sort of orange and, and, and red. And we decide what colour a thing is by the way the they overlap so that if the brain sees a mixture of um, this particular amount of, of the green stimulation with uh, the same amount of red, we go, oh, it's a red colour. And that's how we determine colour vision. Well, reptiles are slightly different and different species of reptiles are different as well. So if we take, say, the turtle, it's got the same three cones, blue, green and red, but it's got an, a fourth cone, which is respons responsive to UVA. So this turtle has a very wide range of colour vision right through from UVA right through to the borderlines of infrared. So it's actually got, if you like, it's got wider colour vision than, than humans have. Um, so, you know, full possibilities of full colour vision there. Can definitely see red. Um, but if we look at other species, they can vary. Um, geckos, for example, um, light in twilight is mainly from after the sun has gone down completely, it's mainly from diffuse light in the sky. So you get a more of a blue under, under UVA light because that's what's um, reflected in the sky as it, as it gets darker. So they have very, very good. Um, vision in that range of light they can differentiate because they all three of their cones will, will register into the blue and, and infrared uh, into uva rather so you get very very good color discrimination in that type of wavelengths they can see into red but they can't necessarily discriminate much color there mm. um, if we look at snakes again they're very hugely um garter snakes don't have any um uh, night vision rods they only have cones so their best vision is in daylight and again they've got very good vision in uva and right through to red so they've, they've got good color vision which is why some of them are very highly colored as well but if we look at things like the boa which is the most more internal activity um, that has a very reduced um, 
It only has two, two mm -hmm. color cones. It's also got a good number of rods for night vision, um, which have a sensitivity somewhere in the, in the blue green. So that can see very well. Um, it can see very well in dusk because it's got the UVA and it uses the rods for, for that. And it can also see some of the greens and reds, but probably it's colorblind in, in that sense. It's like red, green, colorblind. Mm. But you've got a huge range of different colors that animals can see or not see or de determine what the color specifically what the color is they can see the light but they don't know what anticipate what color it is so we have to be a bit careful when we provide lighting we really need to provide a full spectrum of sunlight because that's what it's evolved to use and if we change the colors and alter them then the animals are losing out um and it's just my little example there is is People sometimes say to me, well, can I just use red lights for heating and, and lighting? And you think, well, you're wiping out all of its color vision mm -hmm. um, because everything is either red or shades of gray or black. Um, and particularly if it's got any UVA reflective parts, then you're removing the ability for it to see those as well. So basically, you know, full spectrum light is, is really important. Um, before we move away from the UVA thing, everyone goes on, we don't know much about the UVA, we, we don't measure it, um, but it also does have biological effects. Um, it, in, it increases nitric oxide in the skin, it's a defence reaction, that increases vasodilation, it makes the blood supply better, and it also lowers the blood pressure. So there are, there are things that we don't know much about, which could be quite important. Mm. Um, but before we move away from visible light altogether, I think we should just talk a little bit about this non-visual perception. Because this blows my mind. When I first read this, yeah, from, this I think really it was a section that, of yeah. a textbook that you had written a, a snippet in, and I was just, I couldn't believe this. So please go ahead with that. Yeah, this is, this is, this is what, what's going on in our brains and in animal brains that, that really has only been, only been discovered for perhaps, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And how it works out is that we've got different photopigments. These are the photopigments that we're very familiar with. These are our cones that we see color with. But also at the back of the retina, in the ganglion cells, we've got cells which respond differently. They, they have a different pigment. It's called melanopsin. And it's a non-visual pigment. It doesn't signal to the brain that they can see anything, but it sends signals to parts of the brain that are responsive for um circadian rhythms for all that kind of of out of sight out of mind responses to light and it's mostly responsive to blue it's hi highly responsive to blue everyone goes well why is it why is it blue and it's probably because blue light is one of the the signals of daytime mm. when the sky changes from being dark at night to just before dawn you get the um the diffused, the refracted, what's the right term, scattered, the Raleigh scattering of the sunlight coming up, and it, it comes through as blue and UV. And so, although it's incredibly dim, so you can't really recreate it in a vivarium, but that incredibly dim blue light stimulates these, these little cells, and it goes, oh, it's daytime. And that signals to the brain that, that dawn is coming, and likewise, the opposite at the other end of the evening. And if I just do this little diagram of this, this, this is an iguana. The light doesn't just go into its eyes because reptiles also have these photoresponsive cells with opsins like melanopsin in other parts of the brain as well. And so that the light's going through the lateral eyes, the, the normal eyes. It's also going through for the species that have got them through the um, parietal eye and, and the sensors in that are responsive to blue and green and also light through the skull. And I don't know if any of you have ever held up a leopard gecko to a bright light, you can see right through the head, you know, with, through, the, through the eyes. But when you think about these tiny animals, you hold them up to the light and you can often see the organs through them. So the light's going right through the body of a small animal like that. So it's not really surprising that they've made use of that by having cells inside the brain. So if we just go inside his brain, here they are, here's his brain. Here's just the brain. And we've got the lateral eye, we've got the third eye and we've got underneath in the skull you've got the little third eye and you've got the pineal body which is the area which produces all the hormones and you've got the 
SCN, I can never say super chiasmatic nuclei, which is a little group of cells, which is the clocks, the clock setting mechanism in the brain. And you've got these tiny little photoreceptors lying in the ventricles of the brain. And they're all responding to light. So the signals come from the light and feed into the SCN. And then that feeds back a loop into the pineal, which is the main organ produce, uh, producing the hormones and the neuro network, neuroendocrine network. So you've got a, an amazing system that's responding to the intensity of light, the wavelengths of light, and telling the brain what time of day it is and how bright it is and what season it is because how long the day length is. And it needs to be bright enough. The light that we give them needs to be bright enough to stimulate the brain in this way. Hmm. And when you think about it, if you put a dim light over it, there's not an awful lot going to get through the skull, whereas sunlight is incredibly bright and goes right through the skull. So we, we do have to also think about the intensity that we're producing. This is Quinn Harris's little picture, which he puts up on the forums. It's absolutely wonderful. He went outside with his camera and took a photograph under an overcast sky and also measured the lux, and he got 40,000 lux. He then didn't change the camera settings. He left them exactly the same. And he also measured the lux in his vivarium for his BD, and it was 4,000 lux. So that when he compared the photographs, he went, oh, my gosh, it's really dim in there. It looks like because nighttime course, almost. Yeah, because our eyes immediately, our pupils dilate, mm -hmm. and we see it as bright. If you walk into a, a dim room and your eyes get used to it, you, you think it's bright. And certainly the beardy's eyes will do that as well, but his brain won't because his brain can't open up the way our pupils do. So he sees that, his brain sees that as really dim. And I think that's something that we haven't really got to grips with yet in, in, in our animal husbandry. We can increase the light quite a lot. And then finally, we go right down to the bottom and we talk about vitamin D. So I don't know if we want to talk about that now, or we need warmth as well. Yeah, if, um, we, if or, we want to talk about yeah. UV, yeah, we can, oh, UVB yeah. right now, that's probably a good time, time yeah. to do it. And uh, of course, we've got the control of synthesis, which is the slightly longer wavelengths, and we'll talk about that as well in a minute. So I'll stop showing just for a minute, um, because we were going to talk a little bit, I think we were going to talk a little bit about, about um not nocturnal? Like nocturnal species, won't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll we'll yeah. jump to there first because I think that is one of those. You know, partly, as you're saying, you know, talking about how our pupils dilate and and contract makes it it, it makes mm. you realize how much of our perception confuses us, and it makes it so it's constantly a moving target. Like just our own eyes looking at our enclosures, yeah. we don't even know what we're looking at half the time because your your brain does so much, you know, mapping and so much you know, filling in the gaps. Yeah. So we really can't go off of our own yeah. eyesight, and mm. I think. Nocturnal species are interesting because they typically, you know, it's getting better now, but the general recommendation was they don't need light because they are nocturnal and all the way to the point where many nocturnal species are kept in, in, in tubs that are absent mm. of light, like opaque yeah. tubs. Yeah. So what, what, obviously they must still have some of those hormones being driven off of the solar, the, the, the sun coming up and down. So what are some of these recommendations for, for nocturnal species? It's, it's one of those interesting things, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. if an animal's nocturnal, it still in the wild has to know when it's day and when it's night for it to be nocturnal, if you see what I mean. If it was dark yes. all the time, it would never know when it was day and when it was night. And nocturnal activity is cued by sunset and sunrise. So in the case of nocturnally active creatures, the fact that the light signals to the brain to block the melatonin synthesis Whereas in, in day active ones, that blocking um, makes them wake up. The extraordinary thing is that the biochemistry has changed with the nocturnally active ones in that when you block the melatonin synthesis, it sends them to sleep. Um, and we were looking so at the that. melatonin production is the exact same for both. It, it, it spikes in the evening, but for nocturnal animals, it makes them have energy. And for us, it makes us fall asleep. Yes. Yes, that's, that's right. It's, it is it's extraordinary. It's, it's like the bright light makes the, makes the um, blocks the melatonin and the, when the melatonin starts to drop, the nocturnal animals um, go to sleep because it's daytime. Mm. Um, we looked at that a lot when I was working with um, primates when I was with, working with the zoos because that's they've done quite a lot of work on that. But I mean, going back to the thing about it being dark all the time, 
There isn't anywhere on the surface of the Earth, apart from really deep caves, where daylight doesn't penetrate. Because even in a, a cave or a, a tunnel, you know, you can see the light from the outside. You can see the entrance of the tunnel. You can see whether the sun's there or it isn't there. And the sun always comes and goes in predictable patterns. There's only one place which is really common for it not to do that, and that's in a windowless room or in an opaque rub on a shelf, as you, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And when nocturnal species are studied in the wild, we, we find that most of them aren't strictly nocturnal. Many of them are ephemeral. They're active at any time of the day. Francis Koskeri has a huge collection of photos of, of nocturnal geckos from all over the world that he's photographed out in daylight mm -hmm. and even in full sunlight. And I've got a few of his pictures too, and some of my own. Um, but the main activity period is often at dusk or in the early part of the night because that's when the environment is still warm enough for them to be optimally active. active. So their rhythms synchronise with both light and temperature, changing over the course of the day. So the study we talked about where the Toke gecko altered its body temperature because it could sense the bright light was no longer warming the area below it. Now, that's really interesting. Um, that nocturnal animal is modulating according to the light it sees during the day mm. so yeah I, I i can't see any reason why you would keep an animal without without at least some exposure to the daylight well i, I sort of course, think yeah it, it's you know we are a diurnal species so that they would be making the same claim would be saying well we never need darkness because we are active during the light so we'll just leave the lights on and imagine how crazy that's, you'd go after three yeah. days of that yeah that's right. And actually, it would be very damaging. Yes, it would. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's amazing how resilient reptiles are. I mean, they can live in, 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 in the pitch dark because people have done so. But mm -hmm. it, their body rhythms have got to be uh, skewed, uh, skewed by doing that. So then, you know, theoretically, just say you have an animal that spends most of its time in a hide and it would see the mouth of the hide as the light and that's going to give its cue. You could see a keeper saying, well, why don't I just provide like a simple light bulb that's going to signify the day night? And why do I need to go to the lengths of going UV, full spectrum and infrared if it's only going to be using it as a visual cue, if that makes sense? Well, well it, it isn't really, is it? Um, the the um, the UV is in the light. It's mm -hmm. it's it's very diluted, of course, if the light's very dim. But the proportion of it will be exactly the same because it's not filtered out by the, the cave the light that's coming into the cave has the same spectrum as full sunlight. It's right. just a lot, a lot less of it. Um, so you're still going to get a lot of UVB. And a lot of animals sleep in crevices in bark and in corners of under, under foliage. They're in daylight all day. And, and quite a few, some of the geckos, for example, they sleep on the trunk of the tree, which, which gets full light, full daylight. It may not get actual sunlight because it would be too hot, but... Um, they're getting they're getting UV. They're getting quite high levels of UV sometimes mm -hmm. um, during the day. And, and so, what about the? Th we were talking earlier about the thermal conformers, where they are not necessarily using the bright light as a signal for where to bask. As far as you're concerned, is for setting up lighting would be the exact same, and you'll let them. Maybe you have more cage decor to dim out the light, or, or what? Do you what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I just I, I think I think that's a good one actually. Um, off the top of my head, I think I, I, I just try and replicate dappled sunlight because mm -hmm. underneath trees, you always get that mosaic of, of, of bright and dark. Um, it's sometimes very, very small circles of dark and light all inter intertwining. And I would imagine the thermoconformer can see that as well as anyone else. And, and we'll move into an area which is the right temperature and move around. Most of the thermoconformers aren't strict thermoconformers actually they they tend to shift they go up and down trees and and move around the bark um, to, to maintain the temperature they want um, so they are actually thermoregulating but not in the in the full basking sense right well and i think an, a story that i've told in the podcast before is when i created that sort of dappling effect with my jungle carpet python that was the first time i'd seen his natural coloration and his his pattern come into play as far as camouflage goes because it was this sort of dappling of the sun slants of sun coming through the enclosure and then all of a sudden his 
you know, contrast of dark black bars and yellow bars, it made perfect sense. He became very difficult to see in the back of the enclosure where before it was like very obvious, like there's a yellow and black snake. He can't hide anywhere. But so the animals are off evolving in those environments and they're using that, the speckled sun to, to be part of their camouflage as well. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Doesn't it? Mm-hmm. They've evolved yeah. to, to use the environment that they normally live in. Yeah. So maybe we can shift gears to a little bit more about the, the dusk and dawn, because that was another area you had mentioned early uh, on in the podcast is one of the difficult things with replicating sunlight too, is the fact that it waxes and wanes throughout the day. And we're starting to see people play with that. Uh, Sam, Sam Parrott is yes. a perfect example. Yes. He's gone yes. totally thing. mad doing yeah. this insane project. And it's one of my favorite reptile projects happening right now. And so how important is that dusk and dawn do you think for the physiology of, of reptiles? I think it's becoming a very exciting development. I don't think it's going to be something that most people can afford to do or have right. the knowledge to do, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily a problem because I think I think it's very important not to have all your lights come on at once and all go off at once because you know you, you, the animal just freezes wherever it's sitting if the light suddenly goes off. Um, yeah. I think that could be quite stressful and quite alarming. But it's going to be, it's really hard to create that very, very slow lightning, lightning of the sky before sunrise. And even the slow onset of, of uh, sunrise, you know, when you get that orange colour and then very quickly within four or five minutes even, it's changing automatically to get all the other wavelengths in. Um, so I think you could probably just do a very simple thing. Um, I've never tried to recreate that wonderful slow rise it's quite difficult to actually get um, lamps which will which will do that, uh, and automatic systems that will do that. But if you've got windows in your house and you haven't got a very unusual, very very long twilights and things like that, depending on how far north you live, I suppose, um, your animals do perceive a sort of pale version of natural dawn and dusk through the windows. So that that helps, particularly in the summer. But um, you can you can recreate a very simple dusk and dawn if you just got simple plug in timers and you put your incandescent lamps on first so that the light starts with a, a low level orange red glow. And then a short while later, on come your UV lamps and then maybe finally for full daylight, your metal halides or your LEDs. So you've got a succession of two or three steps, which aren't quite as bad as the whole lot coming on at once and then obviously at sunset you can go off in reverse reverse order and you don't need any extra sort of complicated knowledge of electronics or anything like before that um but there are increasingly sophisticated ways and yes sam perry's project is really quite exciting isn't it um and i think that complicated yeah yeah but i think people will start doing that um but they do need to be like Sam, they do need to, to look very carefully at what the wild animal gets because you could so easily get it completely wrong, couldn't you? You could make the sun rise all the wrong times and everything, which might even be worse. But um, LEDs, I think, are the way forward for that because you can program them so easily into um, arrays coming on with different colour balances. Um, but you can dim incandescent lamps. They're very easy to dim. And you can even get dimming ballasts for T5 high output tubes. And then if you've got the big systems with the patio heaters, you can use controllers to alter the power supply. Um, there's a UK company called SunSwitch that's invented a programmable UVB and infrared system called an EquiD. And it was designed initially for horse solaria. That's why it's called an EquiD. And it creates huge basking zones for zoo animals and horses. Um, And you can program it with a ramp up in the morning and a ramp down in the evening on a PC. Um, And I tested a prototype in my conservatory. I've actually got it here for Blue when he's free roaming. And I can actually show you that. Oh, sure. Uh, Yeah. Um, Here it is. Look, Um, there's the the tubes, the T5 tubes, and there's the... um, the infrared and there's blue down the bottom <laughs> sitting on the edge. Awesome. Um, he eats the tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> he climbs yeah, up he looks like back. he could do some damage in there. Yeah. Oh yeah, he does. He's, he's quite fun. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically um, 
Yeah, I think that's probably, have we covered more or less that? I, th I think we can't go much further with that. Yeah, you know, I think that's a good tip. The just, electronics, and yeah. the electronics are a bit above my level of understanding. Oh, yeah. If anyone wants, they can go back to the episode <laughs> yeah. I did with Sam. You'll see how complicated it is, and he's constantly kind of doing all these algorithms. It's pretty neat. But what I do, too, is I just have my halogens click on mm -hmm. in the morning. That's And I do have one like Philips Philips makes a bulb that you can attach to your Wi-Fi and it allows you yeah. to it's just a simple LED and it will slowly ramp on from nothing to sort of a warmer light so I do that on one of my closures just to sort of simulate a sunrise but yeah. I yeah. think the best well, thing I'm is filter sure. yeah exactly filter sunlight through the window turn the halogens on first and and mm. avoid that complete pitch blackness to full-on daylight over a second is, is probably best so maybe we can wrap up finishing we we're going to talk about UVB so maybe we can go back to that and, and wrap up with mm -hmm. that yeah, okay, I think we yeah. we often relate UVB to to DC three synthesis, and that's kind of where we put all of our eggs in the basket there. But it also does many other things as well. So maybe we could just kind of round out the conversation discussing that. Yeah, sure. This is just a little bit from one of the talks I've given, and I think it's probably I've managed to animate it sufficiently to uh, to run through it. Perfect. Um, so you basically got a sh this is our turtle, is you know that's our reptile. You've got the UVB in the light. And um, first of all, I think people don't often realize that UVB itself has direct local effects, which are quite important on skin. And it kills bacteria, fungi and viruses. And there was a long debate about does, does UVB kill viruses? Yes, it does. It kills viruses and bacteria and fungi on the skin. So that's a direct effect, which is quite beneficial. It also um, affects the skin cells, nothing to do with vitamin D, it's just the way that the UVB works. It, it actually modulates the immune system, it stimulates the white blood cells, the lymphocytes, and we all know it causes tanning, which is the melanocytes um, producing the pigment melanin. So it's important for skin health. I'm talking about sensible amounts of UVB, obviously natural amounts of UVB, not, not just blasting things. Mm -hmm. It also creates beta endorphins in skin. The, the skin cells respond by secreting beta endorphin. Well, of course, that's our happiness hormone. So that gets into the bloodstream. And it's, it's a, a huge stimulus for animals to bask because it makes it feel nice. And I think it does for us too. Um, and of course, vitamin D. So we'll look at the vitamin D. <clears throat> UVB works on cholesterol in skin. It's a very simple biochemical change. It turns that uh, 7-DHC cholesterol into a chemical called pre-D3. When the animal is warm, that pre-D3 transforms itself automatically into vitamin D3. It's, it's, there's a slightly more complicated process than that, but that's a pretty good summary of, of, how, of how it works. So you've got vitamin D3 in the skin. Now, in the skin, it has a local effect on skin cells. <clears throat> Within the skin cells, there are enzymes which will transform the vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxy vitamin D. They hydroxylate the, the vitamin D. And they also have a second enzyme which turns it into 125-hydroxy. And that is an active hormone. That's a very potent hormone. And what it does is inside those cells, it works on the DNA to transcribe genes and also to signal between the cells. So the skin is actually working with the vitamin D3 and it improves the health of the skin because it stimulates antimicrobial peptides. So that's a little, little chemicals which prevent bacteria from, and, and viruses from, from getting into the cells. Also increases the cell wall barrier so that it's a stronger barrier against invasion from pathogens. And also it modulates skin cell division so the skin cells are, are, are tend not to be stimulated to, to divide too much. And it modulates the immune system by working on the, the white blood cells in the skin. So you've got more skin health because of the vitamin D. But the vitamin D doesn't just stay in the skin, it moves into the bloodstream. And that's called systemic effects, the, the effects to the rest of the body. So the first thing the vitamin D3 does is it goes in the bloodstream to the liver. And that enzyme, which we talked about before, converts it to the 25-hydroxy-D and releases it into the bloodstream as that. It doesn't go any further in the liver. You can also have vitamin D3 in the diet doing the same thing. Of course, you haven't got the skin effects, but you've got it going straight through to, to the liver from the gut. And a small amount of it is needed every day to be passed into the bloodstream to go to the kidney, 
where it activates it. It produces that second transformation into the 125-hydroxy D3, which is the active hormone. And that's an endocrine function, which means that it's, it's carried in the bloodstream and it's under very tight control with the levels of parathyroid hormone and the calcium and phosphate in your blood. And what it does is it works on your calcium metabolism. And everybody knows vitamin D and calcium go together. It's been known for many, many years. And what it does is it enables you to take up calcium from the gut and it enables it to be laid down in the bone. And it also keeps the levels up for your muscles, your growth, your reproduction. All of those need calcium. That's the classic picture. And that was all that was known until perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. But what would happen if you had more vitamin D3, if you had the optimal amounts that, that the animal needs when it's naturally in, in a good environment? Well, you then have plenty because you don't need much for this process. So you start to get enough to overflow and to fill up the rest, all the rest of the body. And it goes to all the different organs in the body. And every, virtually every organ they look at has the way of, of picking up the 25-hydroxy-D3 into their cells. And it's called an autocrine and paracrine function, which just means basically it's not a, an endocrine hormone. And also the D3 itself, before it's transformed, that will also flood the system. It has a very short, short life, only, only 24 hours. So you need D3 every day to get that effect of it going into, your, into all the different organs. And that is also transformed inside these cells, just as it was in the skin, to the 25-hydroxy-D and to the 125. So inside the cells, you've got this tiny little system going on in each cell of making active hormone that doesn't escape into the bloodstream because if it did, it would muck up the calcium metabolism. But inside the cells, it does the same things as it did in the skin cells, the gene transcription, the intracellular signaling, and it controls over 2000 genes. It's a really wow. important hormone. And when you look at all the different things that it does, depending on which organ it's in, it's just amazing. It, alters the immune responses, it activates the immune system to um, withstand things like a cytokine storm, identifying um, which proteins are invading and making sure that you, you get an antibody response, not a cytokine storm. It regulates cell division. It's really important in identifying when cells go wrong. So it picks up possible cancer cells and enables them to be thrown out by the body. So it's, it's also preventing problems. It's involved in neural development, in, in um, growing embryos. Um, it's often thought that when they die in shell and they never hatch, it's possibly to do with the lack of vitamin D or the lack of, of uh, calcium, which is because of the lack of vitamin D, um, not enabling the muscle development to, to do that final twist that they need to get the head in the right position to get out of the shell. Um, and also they found that when you have injuries, uh, vitamin D will help repair of nerves. Mm. Um, in humans, it's been worked out that it affects insulin production, it affects cardiac function, it's really complicated systems, and it affects fertility. Um, there have been quite a lot of, of trials of vitamin D actually affecting sperm count um, and obviously affecting egg production because you've got to have the calcium as well for the eggshells and, and to be laid down. And you've also got to have the D3 for the embryo to be able to utilize the calcium. So there's an awful lot going on. Um, and we miss out a lot if we're insufficient, because if you're insufficient, you lose all of that lot straight away. You, you get you, This is absolutely vital for life because you need it for your muscles, your growth. You've got to have this. So the body prioritizes this and forgets, forgets about that. And an awful lot of people are walking around today with mm -hmm. this sort of level of vitamin D enough to keep us going. But you don't get any of that bonus extra you don't get that the you bonus. would normally get if it yeah. was coursing through yeah. your blood. That's wow. right. That's right. But if you get deficient, if you get really deficient, then you haven't even got enough for the kidney to make the calcium metabolism work, you've already lost all your systemic effects and now you're going to start having problems with this. What happens then if you haven't got enough of this is that you can't absorb your calcium from your gut 
and you've got a problem because it can't be laid down into the bone or and this starts to go wrong and this is where you're starting to get your metabolic bone disease because you're starting to get your, your twitching your low calcium and then if it carries on what happens then is your blood calcium levels start to fall and that gives your body a jerk the parathyroid gland cuts in and says hang on guys what's going wrong here it pushes the kidney to produce every bit of parathyroid uh, every bit of uh, 125 it can and what that does it also works on the bone directly is to push the, the calcium to come out of the bones because it wasn't coming out of the gut it's got to come from somewhere and the parathyroid hormone pushes the calcium to come out of the bones to keep you alive and that is where you get your mbd mm -hmm. but i think that's pretty much explained what mbd is you've got these all the, the bones get really frail because they, all the calcium has been leached out of them if you get them healing you get these classic sort of half healed bones this is a little frog believe it or not with mbd and it's just a sad case because it's also totally preventable because you have to be so deficient in vitamin d to have that happen so i think yeah. we better stop there it's really amazing and it sort of it sort of makes you as you learn all these different functions of light in general, not just UV. It, it's hard to not think about yourself as a human thinking, like, oh, yeah. I am barely in the sun, especially living where I live. I don't spend enough time in the sun. And I imagine how much health disorders are associated with just that alone, with not getting any of those extra benefits from D3 oh. being low on D3. And it's, it's pretty remarkable. Yes, it is. And the nice thing about humans is that we're quite good at absorbing it from the gut. Right. So, so supplementing vitamin D, especially when you've got things like COVID around, it's it's really good to do that to get your immune system up to scratch. And there's there's loads of loads of research being done on that. But yeah, you can take vitamin D supplements. Yeah. But well, and the UVB, think... you're missing all the effects that the UVB does. So you know, people say, well, can't I just give my reptiles powdered vitamin D? And I said, well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Definitely can. But you're going to miss out all those effects that we've talked about of the skin and the antibacterial effects and just the general well-being, uh, uh, you know, from, from being out in the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Even that beta endorphin, like you talked about, yeah. that feel good yeah. feeling, mm. you'd be depriving that of the animal without offering it. Yeah. And I think one of the things that happens is now that we're having this very big swing over to UV use, which is great, mm -hmm. I think sometimes people forget that UV needs to be provided properly and you can provide too much or you can set your enclosure up in a way where UV now becomes a danger. It's, it's not just as simple as placing a bulb and putting a basking spot under it because you, if you can get burns and whatnot. So yeah. what are some of the dangers of using it incorrectly and, and how can people make sure they use it safely? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think we do. We, there was a stage where everybody wanted more and more UV and it really caused problems. Mm -hmm. um, reptiles and people and all living things, they've evolved to cope with what they encounter every day uh, in their environment where they evolved and not just cope with it, but also thrive with it. So if we do provide UV, we've got to do it at safe levels. And that doesn't just mean a natural sunlight spectrum it also means not exceeding the sort of levels that the species would see in the wild and i think the ferguson zones can help there in an understanding that we don't want to blast them with high uv but i think one thing that we have to bear in mind is that we don't normally vary the uv level during the day the lamps come on in the morning they go off in the evening and i think fair enough <clears throat> but what it we generally say is, is to have a rule is to offer like morning levels of UV because that's when most species bask rather than the maximum they might get at noon when actually they're more likely to be sheltering and always to pair that UV with the basking lamp so that it's a patch of sunlight mm -hmm. and this is why if you can afford one you know a solar meter 65 UV index meter is really superb for setting up the lamps, monitoring the lifespan of the lamp. Mm -hmm. um, and so I mean, what can go wrong? Well, the major companies like Zoomed, Zilla, Arcadia, they're well aware of the risks of getting the spectrum wrong, um, especially with the non-terrestrial very short wavelengths UVB and UVC. And I don't think they're, I think they're very unlikely to come out with anything hazardous if you follow the recommendations. 
There are still a few lamps out there which are not safe. Mostly they're cheap Chinese imports. They're sold under a brand name that you might not have heard of. Um, some of the cheap fluorescent tubes and compacts can have flaws in the phosphor coatings that let traces of UV see through. Um, small halogen bulbs with no front glass. Now they're being sold as all in one heat light and UV bulbs on Amazon, eBay. And they're often being sell sold direct from China. And they emit a very unnatural spectrum with short wavelength UVB and even UVC in very narrow beams. They can also reach really dangerously high temperatures as well. I nearly set fire to my test kit wow. because I, I put them under little blocks. I have a black, a, a white and a brown block for the temperatures at about a foot distance. And the black block went up to in the 90s centigrade. So Holy. it was nearly, it's, it's actually smoldering. It was terrifying. Wow. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, test so failed. <laughs> that was a 50 watt one. And it was quite a narrow beam, as you can imagine. But you just have to be really careful because they're selling these as UVB all-in-one lamps and, and they're getting, you know, it usually says three naught on it. Why, they, why they've chosen three naught, I have no idea. Um, so if you avoid those, all those sort of things, um, and also there's some Chinese brand UVB LEDs that have appeared recently. Um, again, they usually sent from China. You, you actually order them uh, from the Chinese company. And one or two of them have got dangerous spectra with non-terrestrial UVB. And Serena Wanderlich in Germany has tested a couple and found them to be quite unpleasant. Mm -hmm. um, but if you avoid those and you use the tried and tested products, I suppose the real risk is just overexposure of your eyes and your skin. And I suppose that's just common sense, really. You need to find out what the minimum safe distances are and just don't let the animal get any closer. Um, they always provide shade and shelter from the UV and restrict your sun strength UVB, your morning sun UVB, just restrict it to the basking zone so that you've got a gradient into shade. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is don't use those naps, naps with narrow beams. If you can see that it's only lighting up a small circle that's smaller than your reptile's body, the UVB can be quite concentrated there. I mean, metro, um, Mercury vapor lamps are really prone to that. You get these little circles. Some of them have got awfully narrow beams. And the whole animal isn't getting it. It's just like half of its back. So obviously the heating and the lighting is not going to be normal. Mm -hmm. um, but you probably won't see much in the way of damage. <clears throat> the first sign of, of overexposure is often that photocarrier conjunctivitis, the snow blindness in humans, where... The little cornea is, is so delicate, it's first affected by the UV. And it feels like you've got glass in your eye, which fortunately I've never had. But um, And the reptiles, they huddle with their eyes closed. It's just awful imagining the pain that it is. And sometimes if it's severe, that little eyelids swell up too. Mm. And back in, you know, back in 2005, six was quite a few. And, and But if you remove the lamp... The healing is really quick because the cornea regenerates really fast. It can only take two or three days, even three or four days, and the eyes open again and they're fine. Um, you can get skin sunburns. Um, they're just blisters like it does with us, like thermal burns. Um, if it's chronic, it can cause like an abnormal shedding um, with damaged skin, usually on the back or over the shoulders. And if it's very chronic exposure, you can get prolonged skin damage. And although reptiles are very resistant to skin cancer compared to mammals, you can get, um, you can end up with, with some of the skin cancer, um, but it's very unusual. Um, uh, oh, the other thing is people often ask whether too much UV can cause too much vitamin D mm -hmm. enough to cause toxicity. And it's, quite widely known now that if it doesn't happen in natural sunlight because there's a natural buffering system in the presence of strong sunlight other photo products form as well as the the pre-d3 and also once it's formed into d3 the excess d3 is actually broken down by sunlight if it's not been taken into the body um, but it does require a spectrum similar to sunlight a continuous spectrum in the uvb and up into the uva and some of the new lamps, including some of the prototype UVB LEDs, actually, 
they don't have that type of spectrum. They have little spikes where they think there's going to be really good D3 forming. They're more like D3 drug producing lamps. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, it's only theoretical, the buffering system could be compromised and you could get excess D3. But the the thing is, we've no idea if that's actually going to occur or if it will occur, how long it would take, whether there'd be a buildup or whether the body would just excrete it, you know, like it normally does, it breaks down excess, passes it out in, in the urine and in the feces. But we don't know. We just don't know. And, and I think I'd like to see a lot more research on long-term exposure. Um, no one's done the blood testing, which is what, what you need. And blood testing is expensive. It's going to be quite difficult to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's the nature of mm. new technology developing. We, there's going to be always holes in the knowledge until we kind of understand yeah. how, how yeah. these certain things mm. work. And mm. so I think at the end of the day, if you follow the, you know, stick with the normal brands, the usual reptile brands, follow the packaging. If you don't have a solar meter, make sure the distance is whatever the package says <laughs> and provide shade. Yeah. You can be yeah. pretty sure that you're providing safe amounts of UV. Yes, definitely. Excellent. Well, Dr. Baines, this was a very full conversation. And this is definitely one that people are going to want to go back and listen to more than once because it's one of those ones where you just yeah, listen to things a couple of times to fully grasp it. Is there anything that we didn't say that you wanted to, to mention before? Or did we kind of hit everything we wanted to talk today? Gosh. Seems I think we'll definitely have you back time. on. I think yeah. you're going to have to edit half of it out. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This Too is much. all good stuff. Too much. Yeah. No, it's been really good. Really, really good fun. Yeah. As, as far as for anyone that's looking to get in touch with you, I know you're active on some Facebook group, groups. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you comfortable uh, on reptile lighting? I think you're most, I, I'm always yeah. nervous to give someone yeah. their the email because we don't want to do, you know, who knows what you're going to get bombarded by, but can you let anybody know if they wanted to touch base with you where they could do that? Yeah, I think through the reptile lighting Facebook forum. Um, I'm trying to retire. I've been, I've been gradually you know, saying goodbye to the different forums because I've reached retirement age. I get my pension next month. Um, nice. So I'm slowly, I'm slowly withdrawing a little bit. Um, I've got, to, I've got some things I want to do. I want to write a book. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm still around. And uh, I think through the reptile lighting forum because then if you don't get me and if I'm too busy and I can't answer, I, I tend to struggle with um, private messaging. I'll be absolutely honest. I get so many inquiries and I, I hate, I hate turning them down. But sometimes I just think, well, it's better if they go on the forum and post because we've got a really good admin team. We've got some smashing people and they're really knowledgeable and um, they'll answer the inquiries long before. In fact, quite often I'll start answering one and then I see it's already being answered and somebody you know, says so-and-so is typing and I think, oh, right, let it go, <laughs> yeah. which is really good. It's really nice. Well, so and it's, it's better to have it there. Important. In, oh, in yes. a public forum, because then if oh, someone has yeah. a question, you can search the forum and then the question may already be there. So if you do have a question, just post it publicly and everybody will be able to put their two cents in. And then when the future, when somebody has the same question, it's already there for you. Yeah. If you go to uh, Facebook, Reptile Lighting, and it'll come up. It's got thousands and thousands of members there. Mm. Yeah, it's a fantastic group. Well, Dr. Baines, this was a great conversation. As I already said, I cannot wait to release this for everybody. Thank <laughs> you very much for, for joining me today. I, I had a blast yeah. chatting with you. Thank you. All right. That is the end of that episode. Dr. Baines, thank you so much for jumping on an episode with me. And thank you for going through all that extra work of having the PowerPoint and the slides there. And again, if you're listening to the podcast on audio, definitely go check with the YouTube version because the slides will definitely help you conceptualize some of these topics. So thank you so much. I know the listeners will have absolutely enjoyed it. And I, and like we've talked about privately, we're probably going to do something again not too long in the future. And I cannot wait to get into the topic of lighting on a deeper level than we already did in this episode. Listeners, did you enjoy that episode? I know you did. Let us know in the comments on YouTube. Make sure you let us know. If you do have any questions that you would like answered, put them in the comments. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but it will help me know what questions need to be answered when we do talk about this topic again in the future. If you enjoyed it, make sure you share it on Facebook. This is one of those episodes that really has so much substance. We want to share this on Facebook and Instagram as much as possible. And again, as I said in the intro, I'll try to clip out some of the sections that I think will be very valuable for people too. And if you do find one of those clips, make sure you share those as well. Go to animalsathomenetwork.com if you are looking for the show notes for this episode. And if you would like to join us on Patreon, head to patreon.com slash animalsathome. Thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com. If you're looking for a new reptile enclosure, go check them out. Links are in the description as well as the show notes. 
And that is it for this week, everyone. I will talk to you next Sunday.